Today's scripture reading is from Genesis 39, 1 to 4, and 41, 38 to 43. Genesis 39, 1 to 4. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. Genesis 41, 38 to 43. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot, and they proclaimed before him, Bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Close our eyes and can we pray for a minute, please? Lord God, our Father in heaven, as we come to the time of the preaching of your word, we ask, Father, that this time be yours. Let it be you that people turn to for wisdom and for guidance, knowing that you're there and knowing that you love them. Let it be you that they listen to for wisdom, Lord. Let it be you that they follow. Let everything, Father, be about you. For my words, let them be the words of a fool. Let them be clumsy, let them broke, be broken, let them disappear into the air and be nothing, except that they give glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're continuing the series of going through the gospel project, the material that we're using in our Sunday school classes. And we're getting closer to the end of the book of Genesis, so we started talking about Joseph, about his experiences, and we got up to we spoke about last week how he was sold into slavery about, by his brothers and he was taken away. In chapter 39, we're reading about what happens to him as a slave. We read in chapter 39, verse 1, Now so Joseph had been taken to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the, uh, sorry, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Joseph had been in a terrible situation. He'd been with a family with 12 brothers with his father, and yet had been betrayed by his brothers. First they'd planned to kill him, but then they decided that instead of killing him, they decided to sell him, to sell him to slave traders. And as a result, he was taken away to Egypt. And now we read what happened to him, that he was sold to a high Egyptian official. It was sold to this man called Potiphar. And yet for all these terrible things that had happened to him in the past, so many things that had been happened, that past that was so terrible about being betrayed by his brothers, about being, that they wanted to kill him, about being thrown into that pit. Remember what's in that pit? I come from Australia. Snakes. That's what's in that pit. And yet now he's in Egypt and he's been sold. And so what's life going to be like for him? And it says some strange words. The Lord was with him. We often say that. We say it so often as Christians. In fact, when we finish the service, we're going to sing a song, May the Lord be with you. Christians often greet each other. They pray for each other. They say, May the Lord be with you. Every single time I pray for a person, I pray that they will know that God is with them. We say it so often to each other as Christians, but what does that look like? What is it in our life to have God with you? Do you have God with you? 
Is God with you? Is he with you now? Is he with you in your home? Is he with you in your life? What does it mean to Joseph to say, God is with you? That the Lord was with Joseph. In the Bible, the Old Testament, it says specifically 15 times those words, the Lord was with. It said it about Joshua, it said about Samuel, it said about David. Four times in this chapter, chapter 39 of the book of Genesis, it said about Joseph. Four times it repeated, the Lord was with Joseph. That's nice. I would like the Lord to be with me. I hope he's with me. I hope he's with this church. But what does that look like? What can we say about it? What should we be experiencing? What should life be like if God is truly with us? Genesis 39, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. The Lord was with him, so it brought him success. This is what other people could see, that he was a successful man. His, uh, his master could see it, that there was something different about him, that he was successful. That's a wonderful thing, to be successful, to be successful in your studies. We prayed for these students earlier. We pray that they will be successful in their studies. I pray that you will be successful in your work, in your life, in your marriages, raising your children. Success is a wonderful thing. And verse 3, now his master saw that the Lord was with him. So it wasn't just Joseph saying the Lord is with him. It's his master. Other people could see it. The Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So it wasn't just success, prospering. Gaining in wealth, gaining things, being healthy, all those wonderful things in life. And the master saw it, so it came about that from that time he, that means Potiphar, made him overseer, the boss, the leader in his house over all that he owned. So the Lord was with him, success, prospering, responsibility. That now he was in a position of authority, a position of respect. And it says in verse 5, and it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. That's what it should look like. If the Lord is with you, success. Do you have success? Success in your studies, success in your work, prospering, are you healthy, happy, wise? Everything going well for you? Responsibility. People respect you. People look up to you and say, that's a smart man, a smart woman, a smart person. Blessing. Can you see this in your life? Joseph may have been a slave, but it says that he was a blessed slave. These are wonderful things. And yet we look at this verse, which is this chapter, and see something else. And it really asks, makes us ask, what does this mean? The Lord was with you. What should life be like if that's true for us? And then we get to a very surprising verse, because the Lord was with him, things start to happen. Verse uh, 7, it says, It came about that after these events that his master's wife looked with desire in Joseph and said, Lie with me, have sex with me, come and sleep with me, be my secret lover. And so, in addition to success, prospering, responsibility, and blessing, he had to endure temptation. All of us do. Temptation to eat that too much food, to eat that last bit of chocolate, Temptation when you look at a beautiful woman, a handsome man. Temptation to drink that extra cup of coffee that you shouldn't drink because it won't, so it'll keep you awake all night. Temptation. Where's God then? Well, the Bible says flee, run away. Paul says to Timothy, flee temptation. Okay, that's what he should do. And in fact, that's what he, if we read it later, that's what he does. His answer to this temptation, verse 8 and 9, but he refused and said to his master's wife, how could I do this evil thing and sin against God? He was aware with God. He was very aware that it wasn't just a sin against Potiphar, it was a sin against God. The same as David, when David sinned with Bathsheba. He was aware that it wasn't a sin against Bathsheba's family, 
the sin was against God. Is that what it means that God was with them? That he was aware that this sin was a sin against God? And the temptation went on day after day that she never stopped. Always she tried to be alone with them. Always she tried to cause things to happen between them. And we read, now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was in there inside. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran away as Paul suggested Timothy to do and went outside. I think this was a very bad marriage that we see, a very dysfunctional marriage between Potiphar and his wife because we see her reaction to this. She called to the men of her household. Why did she call to the men? Why not to the women? Why not to other women in the household? But instead she called to the men of the household and said to them, see, he, who's he? It's not Joseph, it's her husband. He has brought a Hebrew slave, a Hebrew to make sport of us. So she starts off criticizing to other men about her husband. And then he changed, she changes it. He, meaning Joseph, came in to, to me to lie with me and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. Where is God in this? That he's had temptation and now false accusation saying that Joseph tried to rape her. Where is God that God was with him? And the master comes home, Potiphar comes home. When his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, this is what your slave did to me. She doesn't have a good relationship with her husband. His, Potiphar's anger burned. And as a result, so Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail and the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. When they say that his anger burned, I don't know if it's really anger directed towards Joseph. Maybe he knows something about his wife and the relationship that they have. Because a slave who tries to rape a woman, the law in Egypt at that time was a slave would be, would be beaten to death. He would be whipped 1,000 times. And this would always kill the person, that he would be whipped until he was dead. And yet he didn't do this. Instead, he chose imprisonment, that he would be imprisoned. But it was a, not a terrible prison. Well, any prison, I guess, is bad, but it's where the king's prisoners were confined. Not the lowest of the criminals, but people who are maybe that higher level, that better level of criminals. I guess we would call them white-collar criminals in modern society. But either way, he's imprisoned. And we have to keep saying this, that God was with him. He had success, he had prospering, he had responsibility, he had blessing, but now this was gone. Where's God? Where is this God that was with him? He had to go through this temptation, he had to go through this false accusation, and now he's in prison and it's all been taken away from him. And yet it continues to say, in the very next verse, it continues to say that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave favor in the, si in the sight of the jailer. Okay, he's now in jail, but at least he's getting favor. He's a favorite in the jail. The jailer is nice to him. The jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. And in the end, it says a similar sort of thing. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. Four times it says the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. When you read the Bible, you read things once, pay attention. You read things twice, really pay attention. Three times, that means God has put lights around it, big circles around it, sort of big things pointing, saying, this is something you should pay attention to. And this is not three times, this is four times. He said, the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord was with him. And so now he's in jail, but we've gone back to the good things. Success, prospering, well, he's in the jail, but he's in a good situation. He's given responsibility again, the chief jailer likes him. And so, he's gone back to the good things. But what happens now? 
He's going to meet other people in his jail. And then it came about after these, the cupbearer and the baker from the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Now, we don't know what they did that they offended him. But if you think about it, the cupbearer, he puts the cup of wine into the, into the pharaoh's hand. The baker, he's baking food for the pharaoh. It doesn't say in the Bible, but I'm going to make a guess what happened. If you're the pharaoh, before you eat your food or drink your wine, you have a taster. He tastes the food, he drinks a little bit of the wine and says, yes, it's okay. And you watch and you see if the taster falls down dead. Maybe he died. Somebody is trying to kill the pharaoh. Somebody is trying to poison him. And the obvious candidate says, that person with the wine and the person with the food. Maybe. I'm just guessing. But if they don't know. Somebody is responsible. Something happened. In which case, maybe they're being held in prison because they could, until they could work out who is responsible. And it says, uh, so he put him in confinement at the house of the captain of the bodyguard. We read earlier, that's Potiphar, in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them. So he was responsible for taking care of them. And he took care of them and they were in confinement for some time. Now, they'll be sad for some reason because they're in the jail. But it tells them on a particular day they were sad for a particular reason. And Joseph noticed this. He said, gee, Joseph asked the Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in the master's house, why your face is so sad today? Well, you'd normally be sad in prison, but today they're especially sad. Something's made them very unhappy. And they told them they had had dreams. When you read the story about dreams, there's a lot of dreams. In particular, there's pairs of dreams. We read about in chapter 37, Joseph had two dreams about the stars bowing down, down to him and about sheath uh, of wheat bowing down to him. Now there's going to be two more dreams, the cupbearer and the baker. And later, there's going to be two, two more dreams by the pharaoh. There's a lot about interpretation of dreams. And so they tell him about their dreams. And Joseph he says, then he, they said to him, we had a dream and there was no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me, please, that he's giving the credit to God. So maybe this is what it means, that God is with him. That he says, it's not me, it's God that's going to help him. The cupbearer's dream, a vine with three branches, with ripe grapes on the branch, that he squeezed the grapes into Pharaoh's cup and he gave the cup to Pharaoh. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, meaning, look me, meaning be kind to him, and restore you to your office. And then he asked, made a special request. Only keep me in mind. Remember me. Remember, I am in this prison. I helped you. I gave you this interpretation. Remember me when, three, when you are released when all goes well with you, and please do me a kindness of mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this jail, out of this house. And the baker's dream, similar. Three baskets with white bread on his head. It seems a bit strange. Okay, three baskets with white bread. But actually in Egypt, that was quite normal. The custom, the pictures we see of uh, Egyptians, the women would always carry things on their shoulder. The men would always carry weight on their head. It's just the Egyptian custom, the way they did things. The top basket had baked food for the pharaoh, and the birds were eating from the basket. Joseph interpreted the dream, and Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation, the three baskets are three days. Within three more days, pharaoh will lift, you, uh, will lift up your head from you, and you will hang on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh of you. You will be found guilty, you will be executed. And this is what happened. He restored, he, Pharaoh, restored the cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into the Pharaoh's hand. Um, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted. The Lord is with him. He was able to interpret these dreams. But what happens? Yet the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Success, prospering, responsibility, blessing. The Lord is with you. Temptation, false accusation, imprisonment, being forgotten. What happened? 
but it continues. And as I said, there's a number of dreams. There's Pharaoh's dream. He has a dream about seven fat cows being eaten by seven thin cows that come out of the Nile. And yet, even after the thin cows eat the fat cows, they're still thin. <laughs> now, as an engineer, to me, that doesn't make any sense. But okay, it's a dream. <laughs> seven fat dreams eaten by seven thin cows, and yet the cows are still thin. That was the first dream. Second dream, seven good ears of wheat. They're eaten by seven bad ears of wheat. And the bad ears are still bad. And so these are the two dreams that he had. And Pharaoh, nobody can interpret the dream. And then the cupbearer, he remembers. He remembers, while I was in jail, I met somebody. A Hebrew, an Israelite. And he was able to interpret these dreams for me. Bring him out of the prison. He'll be able to tell you what it means. And so that's what happens. They bring Joseph out of prison. They wash him. They shave him. They give him new clothes. And they present him to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh tells him the dream. And Pharaoh, Joseph explains it, what the dream means. Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. They are identical. It's the same dream. God has told the Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good year cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. So what will happen to Egypt? Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine will come, where people will be dying of starvation because the food is not growing, the crops are failing, the animals are dying, and all the abundance, all the good things, all the good food you've had in the past will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and famine will ravage, will destroy the land. And then Joseph does something which a criminal, a man in prison shouldn't do. He starts giving Pharaoh advice, saying, this is what you should do. Very brave man to do this to Pharaoh. And he says, now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land in the seven years of abundance. So appoint one man as the top, then appoint local people below him in different areas, and those local people take one-fifth of the crops during the seven good years. They're producing a lot of good food. Take it and store it and keep it for the bad years that are going to come. Let the food be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so the land will not perish during the famine. So he's giving advice and Pharaoh listens and then he looks at Joseph and he says this. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house according to your command. All my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. And suddenly he was raised to be the second most powerful man in Egypt. In Egypt, that would be the superpower of that Mediterranean culture, that Mediterranean world. It was the greatest, the most powerful country in that area. And now he is the second most powerful man in the world, excluding China and Asia and those sort of countries in that area, that he was so powerful. Joseph had made a long journey. Everything had changed. So many things had changed. So many things he had gone through. 17 years of age, he'd been betrayed by his brothers. 17 years of age, his brothers had wanted to kill him. 17 years of age, his brothers had sold him out into slavery. What was your life like when you were 17 years old? Can you imagine going through this when you were 17 years old? Your brothers wanting to kill you. Your brothers selling you into slavery being carried to a country where you don't speak the language, being put up in front of people and say, who will buy this man and use him to work for you? And then imprisoned, and then falsely accused, and all these things that were going on. And now, 13 years later, when he's 30 years old, he stood before Pharaoh and was made the second most powerful man in that Mediterranean world. The Lord was with him. What does that mean? 
the Lord was with him. What should you see in a person's life? What should you see in your own life as the Lord was with you? Do you see this? Prospering, success, responsibility, blessing? I hope so. I hope you see these things. But what about this? What about the other things? What happens then? Did God go away? Did God forget you? Did you do something wrong and God has turned against you? I said before in a sermon, I used to believe in the God of the bus schedules. What I used to call the God of the bus schedules. I used to live in an apartment just around the corner from a bus stop and I had to go to work. And if I get out to the bus stop and one minute later the bus comes, I think, thank you God, God is with me today. But what happens when I get to the bus stop and the bus is just leaving and I've got to wait half an hour for the next bus? How come God isn't with me today? What did I do wrong? And I start thinking about it, saying, okay, I must have done something wrong. I must have upset him. Because that day, God's with me. This day, he's not with me because I just missed the bus. But how often we say that? When we look at the good things, we say God is with us. But what about those times of sickness? What about those times of grief? What about those times when we go through transition, when we're not sure of the future? What about those times? How do you look at those times? How do you see them? When we look at, in perspective, looking at the whole of Joseph's life, we start to realize something. If he hadn't been a slave, he wouldn't have met Potiphar's wife. If Potiphar's wife hadn't betrayed him, hadn't falsely accused him, he wouldn't have gone to prison. If he hadn't gone to prison, he wouldn't have met the cupbearer. If he hadn't met the cupbearer, he wouldn't have met Pharaoh and become the second most powerful man in Egypt. God is with us through the good times but also those bad times that he's also with us. Those times when we feel, where is God? Those times when we feel that he's left us, those times of sickness, those times of grief, those times of sadness, those times of pain, those times of difficulty that we all go through. I became a Christian very late in life. I wasn't brought up in a Christian family. I was baptized in this church. Very few people in Australia are Christian now. And so I never went to church when I was growing up. And I said, 38 years old, a voice spoke to me and said, turn to God. And for a long time I said, from that time, God is with me. What about the time before? What about the time growing up in my family? What about the times in Australia when I never went to church? What about the struggles I had in Australia? The struggles I had when I was traveling around the world? Where was God then? Was it only after 38 years old that suddenly God was with me? And before then, Nick, who's he? And yet when I started to study at seminary, they asked us to do something. The first class I did at seminary, they asked us to do something. And I thought, this is stupid. This is a waste of time. And yet I did it and I realized something. They said, look at the phases of your life. You know, the time when you're in elementary school, time when you're in high school, time when you're in university, time when I was with the Army Reserve, time when I was working as an engineer, different times of your life, different places, whatever those phases are, you know what they are. If you think about your life, you can divide it. There's this part, and there's this part, and there's this part. And then think about the people that God put into your life in those times. When I was nine years old, I wasn't Christian but my best friend was, and I met his mother, and she was the first person who told me the gospel when I was nine years old. I didn't become Christian. She never knew that one day I would be a pastor, but one day I'll see her and I'll tell her. Because she was the first one who told me about God. 
And all of you have got people, those people that change your life, people that give you a new direction, people maybe that hurt you, but because of that, you become a different person. You start to reevaluate, you start to change, you start to realize what is really important and particular events. And I drew this whole chart of my life from when I was born, the earliest I could remember up until starting seminary, starting my study at seminary. And I looked at it, elementary school, high school, my university time, working as an engineer, traveling, Taiwan. And you know what I realized? God was always with me. Always. From when I was born till this moment today, God is with me. Through the difficulty, through the pain, through the good times and through the bad, God is with me. And He's with you. In the morning when you wake up, He is with you. In the night when you go to sleep, He is with you. When you're sick, he is with you. When you're sad, He is with you. When you're lonely, He is with you. And He uses all of those times in a special way to bring you to Him, to bring you to be the person that He wants you to be. The good times and the bad times. We all want those good times, the success, the prospering, the responsibility, the blessing. But we will have the bad times. Jesus had them too. He had temptation. He had false accusation. He had imprisonment. But let us say one thing in this church. Let us say one thing. In this church, in our lives, Jesus will never be forgotten. Let's take a moment and let's pray about the good times and the bad times. And just let's remember that God is with us and we will never forget that it's because of Jesus. Let's pray for a minute. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we confess to you, Lord, that there are so many things that we go through that confuse us, so many doubts, so many things, Father, that say, where are you? and yet you are with us. Let us be able to look at the good times, the bad times, and know that you are always with us, that we belong to you, that our past belongs to you, our present belongs to you, our future belongs to you, everything belongs to you, Father. Because of Jesus, we belong to you. We are your sons and your daughters. Let us never forget that, Lord. Let him never be forgotten. Let us give our times to you, Lord, our lives, our hearts, our souls, everything, Father, that we give to you because you are with us, Emmanuel, God with us, day by day, every day, you are with us, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.